wealth for Britain and her industry could lie under the North Sea in a gas field that dwarfs even Texas. How then should we react when the drillers strike a bonanza? Town. It's going to be a boom town. Well, I know of a million pound proposition down the road here where they're going to build us a build a oh, Hilton. This is the they're going to build uh, not a Hilton, but it's going to be as a Hilton. I like to think I'm sitting on a gold mine, but I have to bring myself up every now and again and think this is one big gamble. I think nothing so exciting as this has happened since the Vikings came over and pinched all the women and bullocks. The country is not geared for an operation of this description at the present time. But with a second industrial revolution on its doorstep, can it afford not to be? I had a bundle of photographs in my bottom drawer. And often I have brought them out, brought them out once more. Yarmouth, base for the world's biggest offshore drilling operation. If there's gold in the sea that has nothing to do with deck chairs or fish, Yarmouth hasn't noticed. Its preoccupation is with the holiday miracle of turning the careworn into the carefree. Oh, you can't keep living in the past, although it was so grand. They were jolly in lots of ways, but you can't keep a living in your old school day. They were such a wonderful time back in days of yore. But they've gone, 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 gone from you forevermore. The future is the concern of people like Thad Smith, a Texan engineer. Well, this town really doesn't know what's going to hit it. As soon as the gas industry really gets started here in a big way, they'll uh, find out there's a real change in store for all of them. Uh, I came here from Houston, Texas back in March to actually prepare this pipe for the laying in the North Sea. Time all the associated industries move in that will be involved in the servicing of the actual drilling, laying of the pipelines, etc. in the North Sea. Apparently that's a rather large strike and it's going to require considerable materials through the Yarmouth area to uh, service it. The type of personnel that we attracted at first uh, seemed to be the ice cream boys. They weren't interested in working. Uh, my experience when I first came was a rather slow method of handling business. They uh, took the attitude that tomorrow would do just as well as today but it's been changed since then. Many things have changed since then. The 20th century gold rush started here in 1959 at Groningen in North Holland. After 26 years of exploring and drilling, the Dutch struck gas. This field is now the second biggest in the world, second only to the Panhandle field in Texas. The Dutch find convinced others that there was a rich gas potential under the North Sea. The rush to state claims began, and Britain got her share in 1964 after international negotiation. It was divided up into blocks of a hundred square miles each. Within 18 months of the drilling rights being put up for sale, 66 companies moved in. They're spending over 110 million pounds in the biggest industrial gamble Europe has ever seen. The companies range in size from the gigantic Standard Oil of New Jersey to the tiny Grizzly Petroleum Company of Canada. There are now 11 rigs drilling for gas in the North Sea and many more to come. Each rig costs 6,000 pounds a day to operate. So far, their success has been phenomenal. Four commercial gas fields have been discovered in the last nine months. Oil men usually expect one drill in 30 to hit the target. In the North Sea, the ratio is one in six. The pipeline's already being laid between the mainland and the first commercial strike. It'll carry 50 million cubic feet of gas a day by next July. Well, all the evidence suggests that we're in luck. It suggests that we're in the same position as Holland, with enough gas for our own needs and some left over for sale. The arguments, therefore, are about the choice between piping the gas overland to ex existing industrial centres for distribution to factories and homes, or else building a brand new industrial region along the east coast. Well, here are some reactions to these alternatives from some of the people concerned. People like town planners, economists, riggers, and local businessmen like Norman Chalk. 
It started about uh, nearly two years ago. And I was sitting in a pub with a friend of mine who is connected with the building business. And um, we were talking about the oil rigs that nobody had ever seen in oil rig. We thought, well, what's going to happen? I, I thought, well, somebody's got to feed them. At this time, I, was, I owned two restaurants um, on the Norfolk Broads. And um, I thought, well, it could be a mad idea, but it's worth going into. So I thought, well, the only thing to do is to work out how much the average healthy, fit man, not saying I'm healthy and fit, can eat um, in one day and, and, and start a basic cost unit on, on that line. So I said to my wife, um, get a lot of stuff in, start cooking, I'll eat it. And I'll keep eating till I stop. We found the men working on the drilling platform um, were working very, very hard and very, very long hours. People think it's big money for them, but they, they really earn it. They come off shift absolutely soaking wet, covered in mud and grease and with grey gills, and they want to eat hard. We found out the, the likes and dislikes of some of the Americans, like pecan pie, uh, black-eyed beans, things like that. We managed to locate them in England. Um, we managed to get them on the rig and we managed to please them. Uh, one American, for instance, uh, he likes a, a large half-pound steak with six eggs on for his breakfast. And the, the thought of it puts me off, but he enjoys it. It's no good finishing on a Friday. When, when the contracting company says jump, you've got to jump. We haven't a regular office we work from. Um, we, we keep in contact with each other fairly well by phone, but if one of us is going to Yarmouth, we'll, we'll meet at a lay-by and stop and discuss the latest situation and things like that, whether certain supplies have got through to, get to go onto the um, uh, supply boat, whether the supply boat's been delayed, or the whole situation can change literally in 10 minutes. Dr. Peter O'Dell lectures in geography at the London School of Economics. Uh, the chairman of the Gas Council has recently suggested that there will be something like four times as much gas available from under the North Sea as we presently consume in the whole country. Now, if we say that something like half of this could be in use by the early 1970s, then we have a situation in which it would only be possible for the Gas Council and the area gas boards to make use of about 30 to 50 percent of that uh, in their existing pipeline network and in the network which they hope to build. That will still leave a great amount of gas left over from the North Sea without a market. And in the interests of getting this country going as rapidly as possible, in the interests of developing new industries and getting the economy moving, uh, my, my, own, my own feeling would be that we should make use of this gas just as quickly as we can. And the best place to use this surplus gas will be right here along the coast in an area where there's plenty of room for industrial expansion, in an area where labor is available, in an area which, as I've said before, is relatively depressed and therefore in need of an injection of new industry to make it equally prosperous with other parts of the country. Kenneth Keith heads the Regional Planning Council which advises the government. I don't think that North Sea gas has any particular or immediate application to the region. Uh, the government has not as yet set out its, dis its a price or distribution policy. And as I understand it, and this uh, came from the minister uh, the other day, the government can't really make its decisions until it can quantify the amount of gas available and measure that against the nation's requirements of gas. 24 oil companies operate from Yarmouth, where development is in the hands of town planner Alan Gilbert. The regional economic councils and the regional planning boards um, will have to take into account the very important agricultural industry of this area and make sure that, uh, that it's not impaired. Um, and they must also uh, uh, be paying considerable attention to the fact that the Broads area and these seaside resorts are part of the national playground and will make an important and major contribution to the opportunities for leisure activities as, as this uh, country gets more and more leisure. In other parts of the world, the gas industry has expanded very quickly in the post-war period. Gas has been the major growth fuel in those areas where it has been available. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico, for example, has developed in the past 20 years to become one of the 
foremost industrial regions in the whole of the United States. We've got to assemble a great deal of basic information and statistics which are not as yet uh, readily available. That is being done, and we are producing um, a, an East Anglian review, which I hope uh, we will be able to publish early next year. As the basis of these, on the basis of these statistics and this review, I think we'll begin to, we'll be able to begin to plan. In the past, the East Coast has been unfavorably placed with reference to the areas with which we've carried on most of our trade, with North America, with uh, the colonies, with the Commonwealth. But with our increasing interest in Europe, then this part of England uh, becomes more attractive. Here we are, right opposite the major ports of Europe, uh, right opposite the new, growing, industrial and populated zones of Europort, of North Germany, South Holland, Northern France. And this too provides an incentive, I think, for industrialists uh, to come along and take advantage of these favorable locations. The discovery of gas in the North Sea hasn't had a marked um, effect on the replanning of this town. Um, our problems were already with us in, in trying to cater for our part, our share in this uh, increased movement of industry and population from the north to the south. Um, and at the moment, we don't know sufficient to be able to make uh, any special plans for uh, uh, the results of finding gas. Already, the gas gamble has attracted speculators anxious to share in any bonanza. Must Ray, must Ray, you know, I brought you from Las Vegas for this thing. Now tell me, what do you think of the prospects here, up to what you've seen it up to now? Well, as you know, I haven't been here before, but I, I think the prospects are enormous. And how, how long do you think this boom is going to last in this area? Well, I'm told there's 50 years of gas now here. And that, that, that's a conservative estimate. Yeah. No, there's, there's a lot. Yes. Yeah. Well, they're obviously going to drill now. Yeah. Everybody's, these, uh, everybody's getting in on the act now. This, it's going to boom. Everybody's going to come down here, industry is going to move down, people are going to come down to live here. Well, people don't spend money unless there's something in it, do they? Well, I was at a, 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 the club, at the Astor Club in London, and uh, we had an engineering show on. And they, uh, uh, one of the directors told me that he got an order for 50 miles of pipeline, gas pipeline. I think that's sensational. <laughs> Gas was first discovered 42 miles out at sea 12 months ago. Now the first pipeline to bring it ashore is practically finished. Already, the strikes are enough to make a big contribution to Britain's fuel needs, and talk of a second industrial revolution can't be dismissed as an oilman's daydream. Advocates of new East Coast development point to the example in the Gulf of Mexico, where industry moved to the coast when gas was discovered. Half the gas used for industry in America goes into factories on that coast. Today, the biggest petrochemical plant in the world stands on what used to be a mosquito swamp. And the pattern is being repeated here at Groningen in Holland, where the Dutch have an exciting program of development for an area similar to Britain's east coast. It's flat, it's agricultural, and it had a pay packet below the national average. This factory, the biggest aluminium plant in Europe, exists because of gas. The average pay is 30 pounds a week. Six years ago, the Dutch had to make the decisions Britain faces today. 
Um, when gas was first struck here in this area, the expectations were very great and all kinds of wild speculations uh, turned up. I believe that um, in the first time, we expected that the gas we discovered here was all to be kept for ourselves. But um, since the amount discovered uh, turned larger and larger, eventually, of course, it was very clear that the whole of the economy of the Netherlands, and uh, the whole of the Netherlands, in fact, would um, uh, profit from this find. The government has built the roads, they have stimulated the building of houses. And, uh, well, this is the most important. If a company wants people, they've got to provide houses. The problem in Holland is that we have an overcrowded population in the western part of Holland. So uh, we have a lack of space in Holland. So we have to spread the population over the whole country. And that is why the government tries to spread the population, and that means tries to spread the employment of the whole country. Well, before we came here, and, and Hans was applying for several jobs in different areas of Holland, and when we talked to friends, they all said, oh, for heaven's sake, you won't go up to this, this undeveloped area. And, well, we, we have never been here before, but somehow we, uh, we, we didn't mind. We'd rather went somewhere where there are less people than, than to the West. I personally, I'm not so fond of, of the West. It's, 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 it's too crowded. Of course, the pay could not be very much less than uh, what they earned in the West of the Netherlands. When they came out here, they had to pay. You had to, to earn the same amount. Well, the sort of people attracted to this part of the country, I would say, are all different kinds of people, from the workmen up to the academic. The workman, perhaps because he can get a better paid position or he can get a house. The other groups, or middle class or academic, because they get a job, uh, uh, providing more challenge. One only has to see what's happened in Groningen in Holland, uh, to, to how it's hit the country. It literally has hit them between the eyes. We can take our lessons from them and, and, and get a plan out. If it falls through, it's only paper, but at least um, if it goes ahead, we've got something concrete to build on and we're, we're not going to be caught with our pants down. Plans are on offer and impatience for action spreads beyond East Anglia. One pioneer is Roy Guzzard, town planner from Tyneside. The English have a natural aptitude for the sea and having done practically everything else with it, the opportunity now exists for them to develop it industrially. Planning means taking situations and events and exploiting them to advantage. It doesn't mean letting events take control of you. The problem in Britain today is one of diminishing resources, resources of clean air, clean water and land. In the middle of these shortages we have the prospect of an abundant supply of power in the middle of the North Sea. Now, this, of course, is in the wrong place, and we appear to be dealing with it as if it were on land, by running pipelines out to the oil rigs to bring the gas ashore. In fact, uh, the position is one of power resources in the sea in a marine environment, not on a land-based environment. And so we've put forward the concept of settlements in the sea specifically to accommodate industry over the uh, gas resources uh, at the well heads. The way in which the settlement is designed consists uh, of a climatron dome, which is an artificial climate uh, on the top of the structure, enclosed by uh, a dome surrounded by helicopter landing platforms, and then below this, an open environment exposed to the climate and the weather, which can be used for promenading when it's uh, suitable. Uh, below this, uh, the structure is supported on four columns, which contain the lifts and services down into these hexagonal cubes. And these cubes are made of concrete, and the walls uh, have built-in flotation chambers so that the uh, voids can be flooded 
and the structure can be sunk into the stable level of the sea, about 50 feet below the waves. In the heart of this complex, and beneath the level of the sea, is what is virtually an enormous uh, gas turbine, which takes the gas in its raw state, burns it, and creates vast quantities of power and low-grade heat, which can be used in the complex. There's nothing outrageous about a, a floating island or settlement in the North Sea. Already there are light ships, pirate radios, and oil rigs. The oil rig in, is, in fact, a prototype sea settlement, and the principles used in its construction can quite well be developed to provide larger structures. Harry Teggin, an Oxford architect, wants to build his city on land reclaimed from the sea. The wash is in the centre of the newly discovered S-fields of the North Sea, which extend down the east coast of England. Advantage could be taken of this fact to reclaim a large portion of the wash as a new city to house about three quarters of a million people. The wash city, which would be like a Venice of the east coast, would in fact be on the north side of the wash, on the area covering the north of the Lynn Deeps and the Boston Deeps and extending down the middle of the wash and would form a residential and port area which would in turn allow the remainder of the wash to be reclaimed in terms of land. The reclamation would amount to about 50,000 acres of land and the reservoirs could provide up to 500 million gallons of water a day, a supply which would cope with the water problems of the whole of the southeast until well into the 21st century. In relation to this scheme, the difficulty with planning in this country is that there's no body capable of undertaking all that it implies. There's nothing effective which covers an area of this sort which would at governmental and at national level cope with a problem and a scale of planning which this sort of impact would have. Neither of these plans has received any official recognition. The government wasn't prepared to spend anything <clears throat> on preliminary surveys. One MP has asked in vain for a detailed and coherent regional policy, but the subject of how Britain can make the best possible use of North Sea gas has not been widely discussed in Parliament. There have been questions about licenses and about nationalisation, that one MP is concerned about the effect of drilling on the fertility of fish, and others worried in case the drilling rigs could be used as nuclear bases. The Minister of Power, Richard Marsh, said, and this is a quote, I begin to despair of ever putting this simply. No one anywhere knows how much gas is in the North Sea at the moment. Uh, the planners seem rather at apathetic about the situation. They don't realise that it's not just men in oil rigs going to drill for oil and, and probably three or four hundred extra people in Yarmouth. When gas, which it certainly will, is piped ashore around here, all sorts of subsidiary industries are going to spring up. I don't think we should be um, too ambitious. I think we should start slowly. We must get the confidence of the people in the region on the one hand and the confidence of the people in Whitehall on the other. So far, I think we've got on to, off to quite a good start. Either we let things drift uh, and we get certain developments taking place on the part of individual entrepreneurs who may decide that they want to put in a plant here or put in a plant there. The other type of planning that one could think in terms of is a kind of positive regional planning involving both economic developments coupled with favorable physical developments whereby the government encourages appropriate types of industrialists to come here with a guarantee that given sufficient quantities of gas on the North Sea then this will be made available to them at the kinds of prices that they must have if they are to go ahead. If you want to have a, a really uh, uh, a ruthlessly efficient organization, I, I should say that you've got to have a dictatorial system, and that's pretty alien to the whole outlook of people in this country. I think the government is guilty of lack of imagination in its whole approach to the sort of planning which we'll need in this country in the future. We've only attempted to solve the problems as they arose and not attempted to provide something which would give impetus to the coming generation. And what we now need in this country isn't permissive planning, but a climate of enthusiasm for positive, progressive planning 
planning that sees some end, which is not just the solving of a problem, but the actual creation of something that we would all find exciting and imaginative. Little grey hairs may make you frown, but you can't keep a living in your wedding gown. They were such marvellous time, both for you and me. But they've gone, gone, more than mine, for eternity.